Amen. So good to see everybody here today. My name is Pastor Joey. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey Church, and I have the honor of sharing with you this morning. Uh, Last week, we talked about the subject of hell, uh, a little bit heavier of a subject for many. Uh, But this week, I have the privilege of speaking about heaven. So uh, I'm a little excited about that because uh, not a lot of people argue about hell. uh, heaven as much, right? We're, we get excited about going there. We're, we're looking forward to it. Um, and so we get to share more about it. And, you know, as I was uh, researching and actually digging into this message, um, you know, as a pastoral staff, when we decided we were going to be teaching on these topics, I remember quickly claiming this topic. I was like, hey, I want heaven. Like, that was the first one uh, I wanted to grab. I took it before anybody else could take it. Uh, and then as I started studying, I became very aware of how deep <laughs> this subject is. I was like, wow, this is, uh, might be a little bit more difficult than I thought to portray very well. Uh, and so I just learned about all the different viewpoints that others may have and, and, and different things that people struggle with and, and understanding of it and maybe miscarriage conceptions of it, I was like, man, I should have just took hell, like, just like, hey, y'all don't want to go there and just preach the good news, right? Um, but we're going to talk about heaven today, so I'm excited, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but man, I- I'm excited to preach on heaven today. Um, I-, I think, you know, there's there's a lot we can learn about it, and there's a lot that people maybe not know about it. Um, you know, we maybe have these ideas that we've formulated uh, from our Sunday school days, or that we've seen in movies, or pictures and cartoons and uh, so we want to bring some some scripture to it to support this idea of what heaven looks like Uh, and you know and the fact that you know what I've learned is more people are motivated not to go to hell than they are to go to heaven and I think it's because of this misconception of heaven this misunderstanding of what heaven is like and it's sad you know even in our western culture I feel like we experience this a little bit more um, because we live at such a high comfort level, right? We live pretty good lives for the most of us. We, you, know, you know, sometimes our biggest struggle is like, hey, that day, you know, the McDonald's machine was down and I can't stand McDonald's. And like, that's our struggles here on earth sometimes, right? Whereas you look at maybe some of the third world countries and they're dealing with their faith being persecuted and attacked and even martyred, you know, they see heaven in a different light that we we may even see it because they see it as a glorious place to to rescue them from the discomforts of this world. Whereas we sometimes go like, hey, Lord, I I just really want to experience this before I go to heaven, right? You've heard people like, Lord, I I can't wait till you come, but please, can can I get married first, right? All the teenagers, can I get married first? Can I experience these things that you've given us? And we somehow hold earth, this comfort of earth, to a whole different regard to what heaven really is. And so I want to kind of walk through this a little bit because I think it's important that we recognize how good heaven is. Amen? So for this reason, I want to dig into this a little bit. And and as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of understandings and things. And this is, I'll be honest with you, this is the most I've ever studied for a message. (laughs) This is the most time I've ever put into to understanding scripture. And because I even had these preconceived thoughts of heaven or things that I felt that I've learned growing up or things that I learned early on or was taught. And I wanted to kind of throw that all out the window and say, Lord, what does scripture say about heaven? And start fresh and remove these false maybe perceptions of what I may have held on to of what it is. So I put a lot of time and I, I raised myself up against a lot of arguments and, and went back and forth with myself a lot. Uh, and so I wanted to bring a, as accurate as a description of heaven as I could this morning. So I'm excited to get into it. I'm excited to learn about it. Uh, but the reality is I came to is no matter how hard I try in this message, that I will never fully grasp, I will never fully explain the goodness of heaven. I'll never fully be able to project to you how great of a place this is. Even Paul agrees with this in 1 Corinthians 2.9. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So I'm going to do my best to help you bring understanding. But if you walk away from today's message and go, hey, you could have done better, I'm going to agree with you that I probably could have done better. Because heaven is that good. So let's pray before we get into it this morning. Father, we invite you into this room. Father God, may my words be your words. Father God, may you speak through uh, this pulpit this morning, God, and share what your people should hear, Father, about Lord, this heavenly place. Father God, this place that you have prepared for us. Lord, maybe you just open our eyes to, uh, to see and open our ears to receive your word today, Father God. May we just come, uh, Lord, with, with humble hearts, Father God, ready to receive your word and how, how you portray it, Lord, in Scripture. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to just share and hear about your place, and we love you and we thank you. In your name, amen. Amen. So I want to jump right into a scripture, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do with no hope. 
For, some, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself descends from heaven with a cry of command and a voice of an archangel and with the sound of trumpet of God. And the dead of Christ will rise first, and, those, and then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so I'm using this as my foundation to get us kicked off today, but I want to stop right there at that last phrase. It says, encourage one another with these words, right? Heaven should be a motivation for you. It should be something you look forward to. You know, like I said, some people in this culture, in our day and age, we're more, we're more worried about not going to hell than we are about what heaven's going to be like. So I want to encourage you this morning with the words of heaven. And I picked this, this verse to kind of kick off with because uh, I think it's important that we lay some foundations. And, and forgive me, I'm going to be doing a lot more teaching today than maybe preaching. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of kind of balancing scripture and understanding of what it is. Uh, and so I picked this verse because it's important that we uh, maybe address one of the first questions that many people have when it comes to heaven is, when I die, do I go immediately to heaven? Or am I kind of asleep until this moment? This scripture, if you take it um, just as itself, may imply that, hey, the dead will rise first. Does that mean... In this moment, does that mean I don't really go to heaven until this moment, this second coming of Christ, this, maybe this rapture of Christ? And for some, that, that, that's how they read this verse and they take it. However, I would argue that this moment where he says, and the dead will rise first, is actually referring to our earthly bodies. That there's going to be a moment that takes place where our bodies are resurrected and glorified for a heavenly purpose. And that may sound confusing, but we're going to go through it. But some people are like, hey, wh where do you get that from? Where, where do you get that understanding from that we'll be in heaven right away? My, my argument is that we'll be in heaven the moment you pass away, the moment your loved ones have passed away, they are in the presence of God. It says, and Paul says it, I'm going to read off a bunch here. I hope you're taking notes today because there's going to be a lot to chew on. There's going to be a lot to hold on to. So write down notes. If you have questions, uh, shoot us a Facebook message. I'll be glad to help answer them. Uh, but Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he essentially makes an argument to be absent from body is to be, is to be at home with the Lord. He also argues in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 24, that he's in this struggle, that he's hard pressed because he says, if I'm alive, you know, I'm to share others with Christ, but it's so much better if I die because I'm with Christ. You can read more about the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7 and how he sees the heavens open up. Jesus on the cross, he's entrusting his spirit to the Father in his last breath on the cross. In Luke 23, it's, it's resembling that he's ready to, for the Father to receive his spirit in that moment. Also in Luke 23, Jesus is telling the thief on the cross that today you will be with me in paradise. There's the transfiguration of Christ in this moment where Christ ascends to heaven and there's the presence of, of like a Moses and Elijah up there, that they're, they're, they're all there in this moment. So there's a lot of scripture that supports this idea that when you die, you're immediately in the presence of God. You're immediately in heaven if you are a believer. And so you may be wondering, okay, what about this glorified body thing? What's the point of this verse? What is the point of adding this scripture of these bodies being risen? And I'll imply to you that this supernatural resurrection takes place, and Paul's really one of the main teachers of this, that our earthly bodies will be transformed to a heavenly body, to be, that would be a glorified body, that they would have a purpose uh, in the end times and, and what's to come. And, and I'm going to share more about that later, but you can read more about these heavenly bodies that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15 in verses 35 through 49 have a body that never gets sick again that that there'll be no aches and no pains and one that's eternal and so they, like i said the question may be what's the purpose of it i would say that our purpose of those heavenly bodies and the purpose that he gives us for those the purpose will be the same to returning back to the original creation to, to how he intended our bodies to function to how we intended them to live and again we'll get more back into that because christ is going to renew all things scripture takes place uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm going to give you the discredit or, or, or disclaimer now. There is so much that I'm kind of jumping over. There's so many timelines and events that you're probably already starting to question, like, well, what happens at this point and this point? Uh, I'm going to give you a little insider track that we are going to be going into a series on Revelation uh, in the next couple months, or I think a month or two. Uh, it's going to be an incredible series where we walk through a lot of these end time events and these things that take place. So I don't want to get too ahead of that. So I'm kind of jumping through some of these timelines a little bit that may be causing questions for you. But like I said, if you have uh, uh, questions about what we're 
teaching today or scripture references, feel free to shoot us a message on Facebook and I'll get back to you uh, with some answers potentially, or even maybe say, hey, hold on until we get to that series in Revelation because we're going to answer that question. Um, so I want to jump right in. I want to establish this idea of being in heaven right away because it really adds to what we're going to talk about next, about heaven itself. Um, because scripture really talks about, and this may be interesting to some, scripture talks about two different types of heavens. Some of you are like, what is happening? <laughs> right? like, there's, there's heaven. What do you mean there's two types of heavens? Well, I would submit to you that if you look through scripture and, and you learn about how it's spoken of, there's this heaven that exists right now, and it's the dwelling place of God. And it's not the same heaven that we're going to spend eternity in. Interesting, the Bible refers to this heaven right now. He refers to it as paradise in Scripture. And it's often referred to it. This is where your loved ones are. They are in paradise now. Your loved ones and believers who have passed away, who are absent, are present with the Lord in this paradise as Scripture would describe it. Jesus uses this word. Paul uses this word. It's found several times in the New Testament. And where Jesus actually, the most famous way you hear, probably hear it, is that time on the cross in Luke 23, 43, where he says to the thief next to him, truly today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise, right? And the best English word that I can, uh, that I found that really uh, helps us understand this word paradise, and maybe how it was intended to be meant when they, when they, they use this word, is, is, is like a park or a garden, uh, it, this, this, this paradise is, is most closely represented to a word of a park or a garden. You can think of maybe like the Garden of Eden as your, your, your mindset. Uh, but it's this place of beauty and relaxation. And I've heard one pastor even put it, uh, it's a place of almost Sabbath, of rest and, and restoration and worship to the Lord. It's a, it's a place where our souls go and our souls to meet with the Lord, to meet with others, to be in communion with Christ. And there's this rest that takes place in, in this temporary place to lead us to what's to come. And I don't want to confuse anybody because there's the, there's the Catholic faith that believes in a place called purgatory. Uh, not purgatory. This is heaven. You are in the presence of God. You are with him. This is the place of God. This is his dwelling place. But I think it, it changes our mindsets a little bit because uh, so much of us have grown up to think of when we picture heaven in our heads in these movies and these comics, we think of the clouds and these pearly gates in the clouds. And, and when we open the door, these, it's full of mansions, Right? And even this word mansions, <laughs> um, I don't want to challenge anybody a little bit, but really the word mansion is only found in one translation, which is the King James Version. And it says in John 4.2, it says, in my father's house there'll be many mansions. But the Greek word that's used here is mone, M-O-N-E. And really it means the word a staying or dwelling or abiding place. And so many translations have even changed this word because our English w- understanding of the word mansion doesn't really mean what it did back then we all think of hey mtv cribs we're all going to have mansions it's going to be amazing we're going to have water slides but really what he's saying is it's better translated to see my father's house has many dwelling places or many rooms and and, and it's not this idea that we're all going to get to heaven and and you know have the film crew with us and showing everybody around this is my golden sink this is my 30 foot water slide it's incredible this is heaven right But I think when you begin to understand what Jesus is saying here, it's so much better than that, honestly. He says, in my Father's house, there's many rooms. He says, in my Father's house, there's many rooms, and there's a room for you, is almost what he's saying. He's preaching the word, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and in my Father's house, there's many rooms for you. For every tribe, every tongue, every nation, there is a room for you in my Father's house. There is a place for you. And it's so much more of a missional mindset when we understand it that way. And it's such a, a better way of thinking than we probably think in our Western culture that, that, that it's not about getting the water slide, but rather it's a missional focus of there is room for those that need to hear about the word of Christ, that there is room for those in heaven, that it is not capped, that there is a room for these people, that there is a place that he is preparing for them. And so this insight I feel like we get into scripture of this, this paradise, of this present day heaven, it's a place, it's a dwelling place of God, and it's a place of communion with Christ and others, a place of rest, a place of worship, a place of singing and crying out, holy, 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 right? And worship to our king. I don't know the full specifics of what this specific time period looks like, but Paul even shares in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was caught up into this paradise, 
In verses 3 and 4, he says, And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. He's referring to himself. Whether in body or out of body, I don't know. Again, reference to this physical body. But God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. So Paul is almost saying, hey, I experienced something pretty incredible in heaven, and I can't really share it with you. It was that incredible, right? It, 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 it was almost reserved for his eyes to experience for what Christ had intended for him. And he says, I can't really sh- share it with you, but let me tell you, it's so much better. We see Paul emphasizing that in Philippians 1, 21 through 24. He's teaching a little bit after this, and he says, for me to live for me to for me to live is Christ and to die is to gain. He's saying it's better for me to die. If I am to live in flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. So again, he's taking, he's removing this idea that somehow earth has a better plan for us or a better comfort for us. He goes, heaven is so much better than where I am right now. And man, I would much rather depart and be with him, but he has placed me here in this moment for your accounts. It isn't that a call for us and an understanding for us that, man, heaven is so much better, but he has us here for a purpose. That he has us here for a plan to share this good news, to spread his gospel so that others may recognize that there's room for you in heaven. That he is preparing a place for you. It's so much better. You can read more. Uh, there's, there's, there's other, we'll probably get to it some more in Revelations, but I didn't want to go too deep into Revelation right now. But 6 and 7 uh, talk about other areas of heaven, maybe what people are currently doing in this time and, and then spending time in that place. But I want to talk about the other heaven that's really uh, categorized in, in Scripture and understood and explained in Scripture. We have this present day heaven, this paradise that is there now. But then it talks about this new heaven. This new heaven that we're going to spend eternity in. And our idea of heaven today, where we'll spend eternity in, this is really what, where we get a lot of our imagery from, or where we should be getting our imagery from, of what new heaven's going to be like, where we'll spend eternity. And it's easy, I know it's easy to merge, like we think of, you know, the, the, the pearly gates and the clouds, but it's really merging those two thoughts together, but it's a separate entity. This is a new heaven, a new creation. And it's described all throughout the book of Revelation, and I am going to steal this from Revelation, even though we're probably going to go there later, because it's really essential to understanding what heaven is. Re- Revelation 21, 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And so look at how this is coupled together, this new heaven and this new earth. He puts them together in the same sentence, and meaning that the eternal heaven is not actually the present heaven, but in a newness, it is thought that it comes down to earth, and earth will be purified by fire. Everything is burned up. Everything is made new. Remember those glorified bodies. And then it is going to return to the perfect form that he has intended for it to be. If you look back, you can think it, it, Isaiah almost compares it to going back to the Garden of Eden times. It's going back to this, this is how I intended creation to be, and I'm going to return it to that perfect form. Some would argue that there's a completely new earth created. I tend to lean on the side that it's going to be purified by fire, uh, and that it will be burned up, and then he will recreate and, and show his creation or replenish creation on this current earth. Uh, again, that's up for debate. Uh, that's my thought on it. Um, and again, uh, forgive me for not giving all the scripture that I'm referencing this from because we're going to get to a lot of it in, in Revelation. But I wanted you to grasp that heaven is a real place. It's a physical place that we'll spend eternity in the physical place. It's so much more than a celestial retirement home, right? That we will be given bodies, that we will walk, and that we will be in the presence of God in this physical place, in a perfected body on a perfected earth. Revelations 21, verses 2 to 3, talk more uh, about this, 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 this transition that takes place in the end times. He says, Revelations uh, 21, 2 to 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And so this, this picture comes to mind of God literally coming down from heaven to dwell with his people in a physical location. And we get this terminology, Emmanuel, God with us, right? That he comes down to live amongst his people, to be the, the king of who he is, to be the ruler. Scripture even describes a new city. We know one of the clear differences that we would have on this new earth as New Jerusalem. 
John shares more about it, continuing in Revelations 21. He says in, in verses 10 through 11, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God is radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper clear as crystal. crystal. He says in, in verse 15, uh, 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 and, the one who spoke, and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square in length, and it's the same as its width. As he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia, which I've added this here for your, for your reference, is about 1,400 miles in length, width, and height are equal. So it's this perfect cube, and it's meant to be 1,400 miles wide, long, tall, and, and it's this perfect cube of 1,400 miles. And it's this city, this golden city, described, he describes it as that the streets will be of gold, right? It will be so pure that it's like glass, gates built purely out of, uh, of pearls, walls of every jewel. And in the middle of the city, John describes this river, this water, he describes it as the river of life flowing directly from the very throne of God and the Lamb, the one who we know as Jesus. And he resides with us. He comes down from heaven, and this new city is established of Jerusalem, which many of us, it, it, this new Jerusalem, that we can really have this image of what heaven is, this, this, this very description of his presence, of his dwelling place, and he will reside with us in this place. And it says that we won't even need the sun or the moon because his glory will be so bright that it will shine throughout all of it. Heaven will be a place where everything is made right. It will be a place where there is no more worry, no more stress, no more blanding boulevard traffic. Can I get an amen? Oh, I hate that road. <laughs> no more family drama. No more bills, right? It's a perfect place. The hot light, the Krispy Kreme is always on. <laughs> but really, the Bible, it does say in, in verses 21 in, uh, Revelations 21.4, that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither there shall be mourning or crying nor pain, and the former things will have passed away. It's hard to even fathom it. It's hard to understand what it means to live like that, to have no pain, no stress, no worry, and to be completely in awe of the presence of who he is. It's going to be an incredible place. It's going to be a physical place. It's going to be a real place, a place that things are made right. And I know as I describe this, some questions probably quickly come to mind and maybe questions you've always had about, about heaven. And so I want to help maybe go through some of those popular questions of what's heaven going to look like. What, I know, what, will there be this? Will there be that? I mean, what's going to happen here? And so I want to walk through some of those questions and maybe help bring understanding. Everybody's favorite question, and you hear it everywhere, will my pets go to heaven? Right? Will, will my pets go? Will there be animals in heaven? Dogs, yes. Cats, no. I mean, it's just that clear in Scripture. <laughs> Sorry, cat lovers. <laughs> no, but if you look at um, Isaiah 11 and 65, really it's, it's, it's tended to be... Um, an insight of this new heaven and new earth, and, and someone said that it's flipping back, flipping back but forth between the new heaven and new earth or the millennial reign of Christ. But really what it, it lists is interesting to me because it says, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. This scripture leads me to believe that there likely will be animals in heaven. I don't know if Fluffy's going to be in heaven. I don't know that. But what I can tell you is that there will be a perfect animal in heaven, right? It seems that he's describing these completely tame creatures will be there in the presence. It's hard to, to imagine that he would remove animals being that it was a part of his original creation with Adam and Eve. That he had Noah save them from the flood. I imagine that he will continue to use animals for some, some sort of, of capacity, being that it was his creation, and he's renewing all creation, that all creation groans for his coming. Jesus comes riding in on a white horse, <laughs> right? So yes, will there be animals? Will your pets be there? I don't know, but if you want to believe they'll be there, cool. I think when you get to heaven, they won't even bother you anymore if they're not, right? <laughs> will we know each other in heaven? 
This is a lot of ones that people have questions of, is, is will we know each other? Will we have these, these relationships that we st- established on earth? And again, looking through scripture and understanding the nature of God, the, the very nature of God is relationship. And he has desired us to have relationship on earth. And so I find it difficult that we would suddenly forget one another. When Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection, his glorified body was still recognizable. When he mentions the former things will pass away, and this is where we kind of get this idea, a lot of people get this idea that we'll no longer know each other. It's often tied to the idea that each account in these instances of former things passing away are tied around these ideas of troubles will pass away, that, 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 that things will be forgotten that were troubling or painful. Paul anticipated uh, that with the Thessalonians that he'll see them in heaven. David says he'll see his son again in heaven. In Luke 16, Abraham, Lazarus, and the rich man, the pastor shared about the story, they were all recognizable after death. In the transfiguration of Jesus, again, I said that they saw Moses and Elijah, they were recognizable. Even in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Paul is almost suggesting that in heaven that we shall know each other even on a fuller and deeper level, a better way than we even knew each other here on earth. That all things will be revealed and we'll know truly who God has created us to be and who we, who, truly who we were even here on this planet. And that begs the question for some of you, will I be married in heaven? Right? Some of you are waiting for this day. Like, will, will I be married in heaven? Will I just pass them by? Or be like, hey, that was my separation. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But I would say pretty clearly Jesus te- teaches in Luke 20 that the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. I believe in the same instance that we'll know each other, we'll know of, of, of the relationships that we had. But I honestly believe in through the understanding of biblical marriage that it was created here for several reasons, that we experience it on earth for several reasons, to one of them to help us with our own temptations of sexual desires, another to procreate, to help, to help uh, grow to his kingdom, and the thirdly, in my mind, is, is an imagery of what heaven will be like in the marriage that we'll have with Christ, this relationship that we'll have with Christ. I think that we are given, we are given this temporary image of, of, of marriage because his eternal and final relationship that we'll have with him well, as he often describes, is much like a marriage. This relationship he has to the church and his believers. So will we be married? No, but I think we'll experience something so much greater in terms of intimacy with the Lord. Will heaven be boring? Right? If your idea of heaven at this point is still these chubby bunnies strumming a harp in the clouds, right? I, 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 did I say bunnies? <laughs> chubby bunnies? Chubby babies. <laughs> uh, everybody loves a good chubby bunny. <laughs> Um, but you might have just woke up if that's your thought. I would say that if you're having a thought that could heaven be boring, I would quickly halt your, your thoughts right there and say, the enemy is trying to persuade me that somehow earth has more to offer than heaven. That somehow earth is going to be better than heaven. That there will be more comfort, that there will be more enjoyment in heaven or, or here on earth. And it's a, a tactic of the enemy to deceive us, to, to think less of this place that he has, pre- he has prepared for us. I think it's important to recall that if he's going to renew our bodies, that he's going to give us this heavenly body, that God made us here to have taste buds. We'll enjoy things still. We'll enjoy dining and eating. That he has given us this idea of of adrenaline and nerves and that convey pleasure to our brain and this capacity for happiness and excitement. I don't think it's a mistake that he has made us all like this. The image that he has created us in says is the image of God. So I believe that a lot of the good that we experience here on earth and how we please God with our bodies, we'll experience to even a higher level in heaven. I believe in the new earth, this new heaven, that is my understanding that we'll still, under, we'll, we'll still enjoy nature, we'll still enjoy his creation, to dine together, to laugh together, enjoy relationship, to enjoy worship to Christ, to enjoy serving Christ. This one might mess with you a little bit. I believe in heaven that we will work, that we will have assigned responsibilities. It says in Revelations 22, 3, that his servants serve him. What does it mean to serve Christ? It means that, you have, that he has given you something to do, that you're serving him, that you're pleasing him, that you're worshiping him. And it would make sense because if you look back at the original creation in Adam and Eve, they were given tasks to care for the garden. They were given responsibility to please him, to worship him through those acts. And it wasn't until the fall of man the, 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 that sin entered that this painful toil became associated with work. 
Scripture depicts the, that God the Father is someone who works and continues to work, that Jesus has continued to be at work, that the angels have jobs and responsibilities. So it's my understanding that in heaven, in this new heaven and earth, that we will have responsibilities, that he would assign things to us that would be of worship to him. You can look at the parable of the talents, and again, this is a, ta- a, a, a parable that's given that's describing the end times, and we often use this parable to discuss of, you know, those who are faithful with little, they will be given much, and I believe that's a principle that he operates with even here on earth, but really, as he, he says this scripture, and he says, you know, good, good job, um, uh, good, uh, sorry, well done, good and faithful servants, for you have been faithful with little, I will set you over much, now go and enter into the joy to me, that almost describes like, hey, you've been faithful with what I've given you here on earth. Now I'm going to set you over much in heaven. That you will have responsibility based off of your faithfulness. So I don't think we'll be bored in heaven. I think there will be things to do. I think even though we will be crying out, holy, 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 and worshiping, that won't be our sole thing that we do. That our lives, that our dedication to him will be a life of worship. That it will be continuously in worship. Some of you are like, but what if it's just, listen, your flesh is what doesn't want to raise your hands in worship. Your flesh is what holds you back from going, is this how many times we're going to sing this chorus, right? You won't feel that in heaven. It will be you knowing the presence of God and not being able to stop declaring who he is. Will we get bored now? It will be a place of no more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. It's the absence of everything evil, and it's in the presence of everything good. And heaven will be the opposite of boredom. It will be the presence of God. I've heard it say it this way, for some of you that are still struggling with this, that you don't go sit in first class and worry about what's going on in the economy, right? <laughs> you're, being, you're treating so well in first class that you're not really too worried about the food or the legroom in the economy. You're in just so much better place. And I believe that's what heaven will be. Heaven will be an upgrade to whatever comfort level you have here now. It will be so much better in his presence. And lastly, I want to talk about is the rewards. Revelations twenty two twelve 12 says, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my rewards with me to repay each of you for what he has done. Listen, God is a rewarder. Some of you are like, hey, I just want to get to heaven and that's enough. That's good enough for me. But he says here that he's a rewarder, that he has more gifts for you. And you're like, well, how can you even give me more? You died on the cross for me. You provided a place for me. But this is in his nature to give to his people, to reward his people. It's in his nature to bless. And again, I don't want to get too far ahead because we're going to go through this in Revelations and, and all these judgments and timelines. But one day we are going to face a judgment. You'll face the judgment of whether or not you had a relationship if your, na- if your name is written in, in his book. But then there's a separate judgment that I believers go through. And he's simply going to ask, what did you do with my son? What did you do with what I entrusted to you? What did you do with the things that I've placed in your care? Because I have a reward for how you handled those things. I have a reward for, for, for how you viewed me, for how you walked out your faith. Don't confuse me. I'm not saying that. that good works get us to heaven, right? We, we, we know this. It's only through faith alone that gets us there. It's, it's a gift from God. It's through the grace of God, and nothing we could do could ever help us fall short of this. You know, co- the culture, the world, society wants to challenge God on this. It wants to believe that if I'm a good person, there's no way God sends that person to hell. We've said this before. Hell is not going to be full of just evil and wicked people, but it's going to be full of people that in you may even thought were good, but had no relationship with him. That we cannot enter into his presence until there has been a sacrifice for the penalty of our sin. And those that don't get to inherit his kingdom will be the ones that say, no thanks God, I'll pay the price. But these rewards that we'll receive in heaven will be based off of how we've handled what he has put into our care. How we treated treated others with his goodness, how we, we told others about him, how, how we stewarded the finances he put into our life, how we stewarded our giftings, our spiritual giftings, how, how, how we, we advanced his kingdom. He's going to look at these things and say, what did you do with my son? What did, what did you do with the knowledge in this relationship? And Paul talks a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. 
and he's speaking to believers and he's speaking about this foundation of Christ that we have and how they're building on it, what they're doing with it. He said, now if anyone builds on the foundation, this foundation of Christ with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, he's really bringing into all these ideas of different ways, different motivations, different, different thoughts that people are putting towards of how they're building up his kingdom. I believe there's things in my life and that I have to bring to the Lord that there will be things that maybe I'm developing out of the wrong motive, out of the wrong heart, so that I'm building it with straw. That maybe I, I'm serving the homeless or I'm doing something for a personal gain. He's saying, that's, that's not the right heart at all. That's not the motivation. That's, that's not really doing anything for the kingdom because you're doing it for your own gain. And so he's saying, what are you building your foundation on? What, what substance are you building it on? How are you serving the Lord? Are you, are you serving in the nursery just because someone asked you from the pulpit to serve in the nursery? Are you doing it unto the Lord? And he says in verse 13 that each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. That it will be brought to light, that it will be seen. I even have this belief that it will be seen by all, that when we know each other and we know each other on a deeper level that Paul talks about, that we'll know what they did on earth to advance his name. So that's why I don't, you don't have to worry so much about the Christians that you feel like are faking it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about criticizing the, 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 the people that you see on TV and I can't believe they do it this way and I can't, uh, why do they sing songs like that? Why do they, listen, they will be accounted for how they advance the gospel. They will be accounted for how they built this foundation. We don't, have to hand, we don't have to worry about that. We can correct, we can teach and lead people into how we believe scripture says, but it's not our job to tear people down and judge others because he says that he's going to do it for us that it will be brought to light, that it will be manifest. We may get to heaven and, and realize that people that we thought were building with gold were really building with straw. Someone that you thought was building with straw and that you criticized was really building with gold. And it says, because it will be revealed in the fire, and the fire will test what sort of, sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built up on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone is burned up, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though himself will be saved. Again, this idea that we don't get into heaven because of our works, but only through the fire. And I don't really, it's hard to really for me to grasp the full understanding of this passage. Because clearly what it says is, whatever you did, that you, that you may have tricked others to believing that you're doing it for the Lord, if he says that that was a weak foundation, that you were clearly doing that for yourself, it's going to be burned up and it will not be accounted for you in heaven. And that there will be this, you will suffer the loss of that reward. And I'm not saying that there will be a condemnation in Christ. I'm not saying that there will be a suffering that takes place because the best way I can describe it is, is, is these rewards are, um, they're kind of like, in today's terms, like the participation trophy versus, you know, the championship gold. You're still going to get in. You're still going to be rewarded into his presence. But I, would, I find it hard to believe that if you receive these rewards, it won't be a self-glorification for yourself, but there'll be such an honor to carry these rewards that he has for you. Scripture often talks about these different crowns. And, and so while I fully don't understand exactly what these rewards look like, many would say that there's, there's about five different types of crowns that he will be, they'll be giving out in these heavenly rewards, these jewels. And I can only imagine what the honor it would be to wear those tools, to wear those crowns before our king. That he would see us and say, well done, good and faithful servants. You carried my name. You did it with the right heart. You did it with the right motive. You did it for me. And I think it's important that we don't miss this idea of what heaven will be like as we get so caught up in today, that we get so caught up in, in momentary comforts and momentary joys that we recognize that he has a reward so much better than the rewards we have here on earth. That what he has for us is so much better in heaven. It's so much better than we can ever imagine in this place that he is preparing for us. Would you just stand to your feet as we pray? we're gonna pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your for your mercies towards us, your grace towards us. God, we thank you that you have 
not made things hidden to us, God, that you revealed in your word this place that you're preparing for us, that you've given us some insight onto it. But Lord, we recognize that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no no mind could even fathom how great it's going to be. Lord, we desire to be in that place with you. We desire for our lives to, to be lived out, to receive those heavenly rewards, to be in your presence, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servants. We desire to be people that inherit your kingdom. And I can't I can't get around how great of a place it's going to be. John describes it in, 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 in these streets of gold and these jewels. And, and while I believe that he's literal, I also believe that he may even be subject to, to hard to describe in English language. That it could be so much better. That even his language to describe what he saw wasn't even in comparison. But he, he was able to share with the best of what we would understand what heaven to look like. It's going to be so much better than we could ever imagine. And this morning, if you're here today, I want you to be there with us. I want you to know him. I want you to have a relationship with him so that you would inherit his kingdom as well. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to just raise your hand and say, hey, I don't know the Lord. I haven't really asked him into my heart. There's, I've been continuing to live in a pattern of sin. I haven't really devoted my life to him. But I know today, after hearing about heaven, I want to be in that place. I want to be in that presence of our King. I want to submit my heart to Him and live for Him. I want to know Him on that level. I'm not motivated just to to run away from hell, but I'm motivated to be into His presence. And if that's you, I want you to slip up a hand so I can pray for you. I'm just gonna pray a prayer over you and if after we pray, you want someone to, to join with you in prayer over that, to pray that prayer over you, to help agree with you in that prayer, to give you more direction, there's, there's a prayer team up here that will help you with that, that you can come see and they'll, they'll guide you in that, they'll pray with you over that. Maybe for some in here, you just, you've been so consumed by these earthly possessions, these earthly rewards, or you've been so driven not to go to a place of hell that you've completely bypassed the idea that you'll one day be in the presence of God if you live the way he's called you to live, that if you walk in relationship with him. So I wanna pray over you today, and if you fall into some of those areas, you're welcome to join any of these people at the prayer team to pray over you, to lead you in that. But Father, we thank you right now for those who wanna give their life to you. God, I pray right now that you would just put a boldness in their heart right now, Father God, to walk forward to one of these prayer team members and to receive you. God, even if they don't, Father, where they're seated, God, I pray that they would just pray a prayer right even now as I pray that, Lord, we, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would forgive us of, of our, our lack of intimacy, our lack of knowledge of you, Father God, that we would recognize that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we declare that you died and rose again for us Lord, so that we simply can inherit your kingdom. You desired relationship with us. You desired family with us. And so, God, I want to be a part of that family. I want to be a part of that relationship. I want to inherit your kingdom, Father. May my life be pleasing to you. I surrender it to you today. And for those that are just struggling with this idea of heaven and this idea of of being consumed with what the world has to offer, God, may you forgive us for ever thinking that you are somehow less than what we have here on earth. God, in all your glory and all your splendor, Father God, may we, just, may we just know you on a deeper level. May we just know who you are. We thank you, Father, for your goodness over our lives and the presence that you have allowed us to experience here. But God, we long for the day that we just experience your complete manifest presence, that we completely experience this covering, that we cannot stop shouting, holy, holy, holy is you, that every time we look down and look back up, we begin to declare again how holy you are. We look forward to the day that we can fellowship with our loved ones, that we can fellowship with you, that we can dine with you, where we can't wait to experience that goodness. But for now, we know you have put us on a call for more to know you. So God, give us a boldness to spread your gospel. Help us realize that there's room for more at your table, that there's room in your heaven, that there's room at your Father's house. 
And God, may we not be selfish and hold it to ourselves, God, but may we have the heart that Paul did and say, I must stay here for someone else's account. So Lord, we submit to you this morning. We submit our desires, our flesh, our own personal gain to you, Lord, and say, Lord, would you seek our hearts? May those rewards that you have for us not be a, a, a selfish ambition, Father God, but be a way to please you. So Lord, we thank you for who you are today in your name. Amen. We're going to continue in this atmosphere. And if you need prayer, if you give into the hearts of the Lord and you want someone on this team to pray with you, I invite you forward to be part of that prayer. But hey, we're so thankful that you guys joined us today. We're so excited that one day we will be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, have a great week, guys.